The town of Hagsgate was shaped like a footprint, long toes splaying from a broad paw and ending in the dark claws of a digger; and indeed, where the other towns of King Hagurd's realm seemed to scratch like sparrows at the mean land, Hagsgate was well and deeply dug in. Its streets were smoothly paved, its gardens glowed, and its proud houses might have grown up out of the earth like trees. Lights shone in every window, and the three travellers could hear voices, and dogs barking, and dishes being scrubbed until they squeaked. They halted by a high hedge, wondering. "Do you suppose we took a wrong turn somewhere, and this isn't Hagsgate at all?" Molly whispered. She brushed foolishly at her hopeless rags and tatters. "I knew I should have brought my good dress," she sighed. Schmendrick rubbed the back of his neck wearily. "It's Hagsgate," he answered her. "It must be Hagsgate. And yet there's no smell of sorcery, no air of black magic. But why the legends, then? Why the fables and fairy tales? Very confusing, especially when you've had half a turnip for dinner." The unicorn said nothing. Beyond the town, darker than dark, King Haggard's castle teetered like a lunatic on stilts, and beyond the castle the sea slid. The scent of the Red Bull moved in the night, cold among the town's smell of cooking and living. Schmendrick said, The good people must all be indoors, counting their blessings. I'll hail them. He stepped forward and threw back his cloak, but he had not yet opened his mouth when a hard voice said out of the air, Save your breath, stranger, while you have it. Four men sprang from behind the hedge. Two of them set their swords at Smendrick's throat, while another guarded Molly with a pair of pistols. The fourth approached the unicorn to seize her mane, but she reared up, shining fiercely, and he jumped away. Your name, the man who had first spoken demanded of Schmendrick. He was middle-aged or more, as were they all, dressed in fine, dull clothing. Gick, said the magician, because of the swords. Gick, mused the man with the pistols, an alien name. Naturally, the first man said, all names are alien in Hagsgate. Well, Mr. Gick, he went on, lowering his sword slightly to the point where Schmendrick's collarbones converged. If you and Mrs. Gick would kindly tell us what brings you skulking here. Schmendrick found his voice at that. I hardly know the woman, he roared. My name is Schmendrick, Schmendrick the Magician, and I am hungry and tired and unpleasant. Put those things away or you'll each have a scorpion by the wrong end. The four men looked at one another. A magician, said the first man. The very thing. Two of the others nodded, but the man who had tried to capture the unicorn grumbled. Anyone can say he's a magician these days. The old standards are, standards are gone. The old values have been abandoned. Besides, a real magician has a beard. Well, if he isn't a magician, the first man said lightly, he'll wish he were soon enough. He sheathed his sword and bowed to Schmendrick and Molly. I am Drin, he said, and it is possibly a pe pleasure to welcome you to Hagsgate. You spoke of being hungry, I believe. That's easily remedied. And then perhaps you will do us a good turn in your professional capacity. Come with me. Grown suddenly gracious and apologetic, he led them towards a lighted inn, where the other three men followed close behind. More townsfolk came running up now, streaming eagerly from their houses with their own dinners half-eaten and their tea left steaming, so that by the time Schmendrick and Molly were seated, there were nearly a hundred people wedged together on the inn's long benches, jammed into the doorway, and falling through the windows. The unicorn, unnoticed, paced slowly after, a white mare with strange eyes. The man named Drin sat at the same table with Schmendrick and Molly, chattering as they ate and filling their glasses with a furry black wine. Molly Grew drank very little. She sat quietly, looking at the faces around her, and noting that none seemed any younger than Drin's face, though a few were very, were much older. There, there was a way in which all the Hagsgate faces were very much alike, but she could not find it. And now, Drin said when the meal was over, now you must permit me to explain why we greeted you so uncivilly. Pish, no need, Schmendrick chuckled. 
The wine had made him chuckly and easy, and had brightened his green eyes to gold. "What I want to know is the reason for the rumours that have Hagsgate full of ghouls and were wolves. Most absurd thing I ever heard of." Dryn smiled. He was a naughty man, with a turtle's hard, empty jaws. "It's the same thing," he said. "Listen. The town of Hagsgate is under a curse." The room was suddenly very still, and in the beery light the faces of the townsfolk looked as tight and pale as cheese. Schmendrick laughed again. "A blessing, you mean? In this bony kingdom of old Haggard's you are like another's land altogether. A spring, an oasis. I agree with you that there's an enchantment here, but I drink to it." Dryn stopped him as he raised his glass. "'Not that toast, my friend. Will you drink to a woe fifty years old? It is that long since our sorrow fell when King Haggard built his castle by the sea. When the witch built it, I think,' Schmendrick wagged a finger at him. "'Credit where it's due, after all.' "'Ah, you know that story,' Dryn said. "'Then you must also know that Haggard refused to pay the witch when her task was completed.' The magician nodded. "'I?' and she cursed him for his greed. Cursed the castle, rather. But what had that to do with Hagsgate? The town had done the witch no wrong. No, Dryn replied, but neither had it done her any good. She could not unmake the castle, or would not, for she fancied herself an artistic sort and boasted that her work was years ahead of its time. Anyway, she came to the elders of Hagsgate and demanded that they force Haggard to pay what was due her. Look at me and see yourselves, she rasped. That's the true test of a town or a king. A lord who cheats an ugly old witch will cheat his own folks by and by. Stop him while you can, before you grow used to him. Dryn sipped his wine and thoughtfully filled Schmendrick's glass one more, one more time. Haggard paid her no money, he went on, and Hagsgate, alas, paid her no heed. She was treated politely and referred to the proper authorities, whereupon she flew into a fury and screamed that in our eagerness to make no enemies at all, we had now made two. He paused, covering his eyes with lids so thin that Molly was sure that she could see through them like a bird. With his eyes closed, he said, it was then that she cursed Haggard's castle and cursed our town as well. Thus his greed brought ruin upon us all. In the sighing silence, Molly Grew's voice came down like a hammer on a horseshoe, as though she was once again berating poor Captain Cully. Haggard's less at fault than you yourselves, she mocked the folk of Hagsgate, for he was only one thief, and you were many. You earned your trouble by your own avarice, not your king's.